Yeah, it's on. Check, check, check. Check. Check, check. It's on. Check. 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 Y'all see what you did, Kenny. You ain't, yeah, you ain't slick. You know what's going to happen to this. Huh? All right. I'm just letting you know. Hey, Kenny, what's after us? I forgot. After us is prayer? Oh, okay. We good. I just... Then we go that way. No, we don't come. We don't go. Well, we say happy Sabbath one more time to our Emmanuel Brinklow family and those that are watching online. I got my man 100 grand. I got my man Miles here with me. Miles, you're looking sharp, brother. I can't quite rock the suit with the shoes, but this brother is looking sharp. How you doing this Sabbath morning? Good. Thank Good. You. Huh? Thank you. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm telling y'all, man. I, Woo, I can't do it, man. You, you shop, you shop. Listen, man, I'm just excited once again to be a house of the Lord with my man, Miles. And uh, Miles, just tell, tell the folk online that are watching, how was your summer? It was great. Um, I went to a summer camp, senior summer camp, and I did a lot of good stuff there. And, and then I went to um, robotics camp and man. made some stuff there. And... Then I went to another camp called Mount Etna Camp, Man. and we did all sorts of stuff there. So. Boy, this, this boy, Miles, had a good summer. Y'all remember going to camp back in the day? I wish I could still go to camp. I know I'm a little old for camp, man, but I wish I could go to a little... We need a camp for adults. I'm going to start a petition. I'm going to write President Biden. We need an adult camp where we can just chill, hang out, and um, just enjoy the Lord. Put in the chat, what did you do this summer? I know what you might have did last summer, but what did you do this summer? And Miles, I heard something special happen to you at camp this summer. What was that? I got baptized. Oh, ho, ho. come on. Somebody put some clapping hands in the chat. Somebody thank God. Somebody, my man Miles made a forever decision to become a friend of Jesus, and he showed the world through baptism that he loved. Man, I'm proud of you, brother. Thank you. Listen, man, we have so much negative pub about black young men on TV or what they're doing or what they're not doing. But I wish some cameras was shown, were there when my man Miles went to the water grave. I don't, you got a cell phone, Miles? You got a cell phone? Um, no. Okay, he ain't got a cell phone yet. Because um, when my son was 11, he ain't have a cell phone yet either. I'm thinking about canceling uh, his number now. But if he had a cell number, I would tell everybody to text you and say, congratulations, Miles. Put that in the chat. Congratulations, Miles. We're so thankful for what God is doing in your life. Uh, we're so thankful that you had a great summer. But as you all know, what goes up, you probably learned this in robotics camp, what goes up must come what? Down. Yeah, that's good. That's a smart kid. On Monday, something happens. What happens this coming Monday? School starts. Uh, hey, did y'all hear in this voice? School starts. Well, you start school, man. Man, you had a great summer. Two camps, got baptized, traveled, had a great time. But on Monday, he goes back to school. Shout out to all our young people going back to school on Monday or the next Monday. Our teachers, God bless you. But once you're down, you sometimes go up. Well, he, he starts school on Monday, and then Tuesday is your what? Birthday. It's your birthday. You turn how old? 11. All right, look. Can I do this? 
Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to issue a challenge. Everybody send my man Miles $11. He turns 11. Uh, or if you want to send it to me, I'll make sure I pray for him. How, how about that? Send my man Miles $11. He turns 11. And before his birthday, before his 11th birthday, he wanted to get baptized. And he wanted to just shout y'all out. What's one thing that you want to tell everybody watching online that you're thankful that Jesus did for you? I'm thankful that I had a good time in summer and that I have a family. Oh, wow. That's good. Listen, guys, we're excited today. Man, don't y'all just want to take him home with you, but you can't. He got parents. Listen, I'm excited just to be in the house of the Lord one more day. I got my man Miles looking sharp. I need to borrow that outfit. Um, we're excited about what God is going to do today. Go and text three people. Tell them, hurry up. Come enjoy this worship experience. God is about to do something amazing. God bless you. Wonderful. <clears throat> Wonderful. It's time to pray. It's time to pray. And I like Miles' outfit. I tried to dress a little bit like Miles uh, today, just uh, missing the sneakers. But God is good all the time. What do you say? And what a joy it is to be in the house of God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Wherever you are, in your kitchen, in your living room, in your bedroom even, we ask that you just pause a moment, bow our heads, and let's lift up our hearts to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. We heard that it was uh, Miles' birthday coming, Lord, but today we celebrate the birthday of the world. We thank you, Lord, that you have created this day for our pleasure. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is your gift to us, Lord. We rest in your goodness. We thank you that our bosses can't trouble us. They can't ask us to do things, but today is the day that we listen to the voice of God. Today is the day that we hear you through the spoken word and in nature and in fellowship with one another and in the house of God. Thank you, Lord. For the seventh day Sabbath. It is a gift, Lord, that remembers that you are not only our creator, but also our redeemer. So we thank you for saving us, for dying on the cross. Oh, Lord, but we recognize that though you made this world perfect, we are not living in heaven just yet. That there is pain, that there is headache, that there is heartache all around us. We pray for our world, Lord, in all of the intercultural, intercountry uh, conflicts. We pray for our country here in the U.S. in the various decisions and heartaches and pain and mass murders and tribulations that we go through. We pray for our church, Lord. We pray that you will help our church minister to our community. We pray that you will help our church work through the pain, the pain that we face of sickness. Lord, there are many who are sick and who are asking for relief. Lord, today we lift them up to you in prayer. We pray for our medical staff, pray for our doctors and our nurses who aim to bring relief. Lord, we pray for them as they minister to the sick. But Lord, though our confidence is in the medical staff, our faith is in Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you will touch the sick today, but especially come close to those who are bereaved. Lord, we think of uh, Sister Christine uh, Hill today as even a symbol of all those who are bereaved. We ask that you will be with her, be with her wonderful sons and their families be with them, Lord, as they lay to rest, soldier of the cross, Brother Warwick Hill. And we thank you for his years of service, not only to the church, but also to the community. So today now, we ask that you will be with the man of God, Dr. Noah Washington, as he opens your word. Dear Lord, we ask that his words will speak straight to our hearts, that we will cry out, what must we do to be saved? But also, how can we be better persons to our families and to our community? So into your hands, 
we commit our service this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. It is our privilege and our pleasure to be in the house of God one more time. Amen. We thank God for his goodness, his love, his mercies towards us. And I thank God for prayer. Did you hear that prayer? I thank God so much for the blessing of lifting each other in prayer to our Heavenly Father. Just a few pastoral comments this morning that we want to bring to your attention. Tomorrow is our grocery grab and grow grocery grab and go program. Amen. It is still going. It is still going strong. And I'm telling you right now, there are people being touched beyond the groceries by the ministry of grocery grab and go. There was someone, I was just told just today that there was someone who showed up at church last Sabbath. Now, were we in person last Sabbath? We were in person last Sabbath, right? Then it was the Sabbath before that. There was a person who came here for church when it was not an in-person Sabbath. And they were here because of grocery grab and go. So I'm just telling you that God is working. But tomorrow morning, we need men. We need women and men, but we need manpower early in the morning because we've got some heavy things that need to be lifted. And we need to get things set up for, for the program tomorrow morning and the distribution. So men, 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 please, please come on out. Also, today is our Sabbath school at 1.30. Sister Juanita Warren will be uh, our chairperson, the person who will be hosting today and teaching the lesson. I don't know about you, but if you have studied this week's lesson, you have been blessed. I was so blessed this week that you've got to come on at 1.30 and get into this study that deals with how God helps us in the middle of our trials and our, and our crucibles that we go through. You've got to check it out. That's today at 1.30. And then also next Sabbath, next Sabbath is Women's Day. Sister Sakima Rhodes, Kima Kima. That sister, if you see her online, just a fun-loving powerful speaker will be our presenter for that day and then the music will be by sister Monique Steele Griffin you don't want to miss that it's going to be a high day for our women and our brothers so come on out next Sabbath is women's day praise God by the way I think I think every day might be women's day just for the record I, I just think every day might be women's day because I don't want to be in a world without sisters so we need them we want to support them we want them to know that God is with them Next Sabbath is Women's Day. Come on out. Um, also, September 17th, we are back. September 17th, we are back every single Sabbath. And what I want you to do at home, I want you to do today, is I want to get a run and start on prayer cover when we come back in person. We're going to need the Lord to shield us, protect us, watch over us so that nothing bad happens to this church or anyone in it when we are here. We want to follow the protocols, and I want to ask you to start praying now that God will give us the right spirit to follow the rules. We're trying to stay safe, and we're trying to worship God in person. Let's start now. Let's prepare our hearts now for what God is going to do beginning September 17. And then we want to remember a couple of things today that have got our hearts a little broken. Today is the first Sabbath that Sister Hill will be without Warwick Hill. It's the first Sabbath. I talked to Sister Hill. She told me they have been married 60 years. Do you hear me? Church family, 60 years, they've been walking this journey together. Many of those years, they weren't Seventh-day Adventists when they were married, but for the majority of those years, they were Seventh-day Adventists. This is her first Sabbath in ages without her man. We want to remember Sister Hill. We love her so much. We ask that God's Spirit will be with her. Remember her today in your prayers and in your thoughts. Elder Warwick Hill passed away this week, and our hearts break for him. He is one of those stalwart members of Brinklow. I wish I could tell you how much he did for this church. We appreciate him. And then also, uh, uh, Sister Christine Haynes, our prayer coordinator. We want to continue to remember the Haynes family, especially Sister Christine, as she continues to grieve the loss of her mother. Uh, and then I heard Sister Yvette Douglas lost two, two cousins this week, one to cancer and one to a heart attack. 
There's a lot happening in our world, beloved. But God is good. I also heard today, this is the last thing I'll say, I also heard this week from Brother Carvin's Julian. Brother Julian got a new kidney, and he told me, they told him, brother, you don't have to be on dialysis no more. You ain't got to do nothing. It's just been like a couple of weeks since he's got the kidney. It has taken to his body. He is healing up well. He is doing well in the Lord Carvin's. Happy Sabbath. God is still at work, family of God. As we continue our worship today, let us worship him in spirit and in truth and pour a little praise on him because he's worthy. God bless you. see I'm here at the Grand Canyon bringing this video to you today wishing you a wonderful Sabbath blessing as you go through your worship experience now we've been talking about fitness in our pastor's fitness corner and I'm giving you kind of six things to focus on I promise you that I'll circle back to each one of them but I'm not going to take the time to do it today I just want to say happy Sabbath to you and I want you to enjoy this blessed Sabbath day I'm here of course with India my brother Mark and his wife uh, Vivian and Marlene, we're here at the Grand Canyon having a wonderful time. You are on my heart and on my mind. God bless you today. Look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Be blessed. Stories of the Bible. Jesus heals a man born blind. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He did many miracles and healed people of their sickness. Oh, hey, everyone. One day, Jesus was walking with his disciples, and he saw a man who was born blind. Hey, Jesus. His disciples wondered whose fault it was that this man was blind. Jesus told them it was not because anyone sinned, but rather it was because the power of God could be shown through this man's life. Then Jesus spit on the ground and made mud. He spread the mud over the blind man's eyes and told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and did as Jesus said, and he could see. Wow! The man's neighbors and others who knew him as a blind man wondered if this was the same man. Is that the same guy? No way. They said, no, he just looks like him. It's right. No, it can't be. But the blind man kept saying, yes, it's me. So the people asked, who healed you? What happened? And the man told them all that Jesus had done for him. Well, that's what happened. The people asked, where is Jesus now? But the man didn't know. Come on, yeah. So the people took the man to the Pharisees because it was the Sabbath, the day of rest, and they thought Jesus shouldn't have made mud and healed the man on the Sabbath. The Pharisees asked the man so many questions. Eh, what's going on? And he answered them, I was blind, but now I can see. The Pharisees kept asking more questions. They even brought the man's parents in to ask them questions, but they wouldn't answer because they were afraid of the Pharisees. Finally, the man had enough and yelled, mm -hmm. Look, I told you once, why do you want to hear it again? If this man were not from God, he couldn't have made me see. The Pharisees were so mad at the man for saying this that they threw him out of the synagogue. Jesus heard what happened, oh, hey there. and he found the man and asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Wow! Yes, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped Jesus.
Amen and amen again. Well, family of God, this morning we have a very special message that's coming to us from the Lord. Our own Bishop Reverend Dr. Noah Washington is going to speak to us today from the Word of God. But as a preamble to that powerful message that I know is coming, we've got a little bit of a discussion. Here's the question. Here's the question. Here's the question. I've, 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 got, I've got eminently qualified people who can answer this question. What change has the gospel made in your life? How many know we're, we're in a new series here at Emmanuel Brinkler? We're in a new series. We're talking about community. We're talking about the Jesus Challenge. Y'all remember that? The Jesus Challenge. You got to share it with somebody you know in your family and then somebody, you know, where else? Where family, familiar, and, and, and something else, right? You got to share Jesus. So here's the question. What difference? What difference? I want to start with you, Dr. Van Dion Griffin. What difference? What has changed since the gospel came? Uh, what, what has changed in my life and uh, for me personally, it, 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 the gospel reminded me uh, of how far God is willing to go to save me. Um, because, as, especially as we relate to the community, and sometimes we can be so condescending about what's going on in somebody else's life. Um, but what I have been reminded of each time I see someone who, who is in need is I have that same need. Even though I may not be where they are standing, holding a cardboard in my hand, I still have this need to be saved and set free and delivered as they do standing on the street. So it's, it's made a difference in my life to help me realize God is willing to go at great lengths to save somebody like me. Somebody said uttermost and? Guttermost. Guttermost, literally. Now, I'm going to run off this stage because I got to go get my phone to read something to y'all on this very question. But Elder, would you continue? Yes. And then Elder Crary, if you would as well. I'll be right back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, uh, what difference? That's what you asked me, Van. Mm -hmm. What difference mm -hmm. does the gospel make? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I would say for me, uh, the key word would be change. Mm -hmm. in, in the, the, the Bible says in uh, Revelation 3 that uh, we are Laodicea. We, mm -hmm. the church at the last days, and Laodicea say they think that they are you know rich, rich. increasing goods yeah. uh, but they know not that they're miserable and that's really I thought I was all of that you know I thought that I was the gospel I guess took the scales from my eyes and made me see that I'm not all that I remember my grandmother she said to us as children she said to us um, uh, you know I need somebody to to vacuum the house we, we, we would say hoover the house but you wouldn't understand that vacuum the house and and uh you know one by one the, the the children scurried away and there were five of us and then gran looked at me she said jeffrey you know will you will you do it and i remember saying to my grand gran i know i'm good but i'm not that good mm. you know and i really had a moral i thought i was you know the best person, but the gospel helped me to see that I'm wretched, mm. miserable, poor, and that's made me, I think, more empathetic, more willing to accept counsel, and more patient uh, with other people. So, as much as we may think we've achieved, the gospel helped me to see that I still have a long way to go. Mm. Elder Craig? Well, for me, it's a couple of things. One thing is the gospel really for my entire life has given me direction. Um, as we grow up and advance and move through life, the questions are always there. What, what am I really supposed to be doing? Or what am I supposed to do next? But having a connection with Christ allows him to communicate with you mm -hmm. in a way that gives you guidance and with that guidance, you begin to realize that through his spirit, you can reach others. You can help others. So that's a tremendous part of it. The second part is even bigger. He gave me a way out. Yes. <laughs> I'm a sinner. Yes, sir. And when you come to the realization of how sinful you are, and yet God has given us a way out, 
we can appeal to him. We can go to him. We can confess our sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's my joy. Because if I look at me, I'm finished. Mm. There's nothing good here. Nothing good here. So I'm just thankful to God because yes. he's done so much for me Hallelujah. in those ways. Thank you, Elder Query. There's just something I want to share. For me, it's that it has settled the whole destiny piece. The destiny piece is, is settled by God's grace, and I thank him for that. He took, he took the word, he took the, the big question off the table. Yes. Yes. You know, what, what's going to happen to you at the end of time? Well, I, I know now. Yes. I don't have to wait. I know now that my destiny is sure if I remain simply accepting what Jesus has already done. That's yes. already done. But I want to share something about the difference, the difference, the difference that the gospel makes. This is from Sister Hill. Okay? I sat with her about a week ago, and Sister Hill, she, I asked her, I said, Sister Hill, tell me about your husband. He was in the hospital at the time. She said, Dwayne, he is a other-focused person. She said this, when I think of him, words come to mind, humility, integrity, mm. selflessness. Mm. There was never a time when I doubted that he loved me. Wow. That's what she said about her man. Then I wrote it down. It was so profound. Then she said this. She said, and, 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 and when he fell in love with Jesus. My, my, my. Have mercy. Because <laughs> some of that was pre-Jesus. Yes, sir. She said, but when he met Jesus. Uh. She said, our love and our marriage got stronger. It went to a different level. She said, we knew him theoretically, but when we got to know him experientially. Wow. She said, it changed our lives. It made all the difference in the world. Yes. That's the gospel. Yes. <laughs> Is that the gospel? That's the gospel. Mercy. Now, I want to ask you really quickly, if, we, if we're allowed. Are we allowed to go just, just one, one more round? What is the gospel? What is the gospel to you? We know what it does. What is it? We don't want to take that for granted. Dr. Van? The gospel for me is knowing that I never have to get at the back of the line and start all over with Jesus when I mess up. Have mercy. That's what the gospel is to me. I never have to get at the back of the line and earn my way back to good graces with him. When I mess up, he picks me up, and we start from where we are. No more back lines. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Ooh, that, that, boy, you need time. I'm going to need to give you more time for that. You know? that's, that's rich. That is so rich. Amen. The gospel Dr. Brown. is, as we know it to be, is good news. In a world that's just filled with bad news, who would not want some good news. So whatever I'm going through, I understand that with the gospel, it's like uh, good medicine or sweet medicine. It can make it better. Mm. Mm. Have mercy. Mm. And for me, the gospel is the gift of Jesus is the ultimate gift for my life. And for anybody's life that will accept his offering. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've gone through. If you accept that gift, you can be saved. The Bible says simply, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen. And it's free. Is anybody thankful today Amen. for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Wherever you are, maybe you just need to put in the chat, I'm thankful for Jesus today. God bless you.
love of God is greater far than time and pain can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star. Well, we praise God again for one more day, and we thank God for being a good God, and we thank God that last night was not our last night, and indeed, when we woke up this morning, we saw new mercy, and if you're just glad to be alive one more day, why don't you, in whatever way you feel, whatever way you need to, whatever way that's appropriate to you, whatever way you think God should be Bless. Why don't you put something in the chat and just say, thank you, Lord, for one more day. Thank you, Lord, that I am alive. Thank you, Lord, for being just that good. Well, I want to jaywalk right into our text of Scripture this morning, this afternoon, as the Lord has laid on my heart something that I want to share as we have uh, just this past Wednesday started a new series called Community. And... We want to specifically share the gospel of Jesus Christ with our family members, our friends, and the familiar people in the places and spaces of our lives. And someone asked me this week, they they said, Pastor, what is the gospel? What exactly is the gospel? And by by God's grace, I want to share today what that is. If you would turn to me to the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, 
And I want to read the first six verses. I'm sorry. I want to start in verse 6. And I want to read a few verses after that. Matthew 26 and starting in verse 6. Your Bible reads like this. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster box of very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. I feel my help today. But when Jesus, when his disciples, when Jesus' disciples saw it, when they saw what this woman did, they were upset. And they said, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said this to his disciples. And this is, this is, this is really where I want to hang my hat today. I, I love what Jesus said. He said to his disciples, why are you bothering this woman? <laughs> leave her alone for she has done a good work for me for the poor you'll always have but for me you do not have always for in pouring this fragrant oil on my body she did it for my burial and this is the text Doc Griffin that messed me up this is what I've been tripping on y'all all week here it is verse 13 I say unto you Whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done should be told. That's, that's what messed me up. He said to them, when you talk about the gospel, don't leave out this woman's story. And I want to talk today with this thought in mind. It's worth sharing. That's what I want to talk about today. Father, we thank you for one more day. In Jesus' name, amen. It's worth sharing. We started a new series this past Wednesday called Community that seeks to intentionally share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us have family members, friends, and familiar people in the places and spaces of our lives who desperately need to hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and experience the power of the cross. And if the truth be told, there are arguably not enough billboards seen. There aren't enough media marketers. There aren't enough people sharing. Ambassadors are absent. The world is arguably and possibly AWOL and lacking of people who are so sold out to Jesus that the power and beauty of the Lord's presence is seen and felt on the earth. And I don't want you to miss today what I'm saying. I want to be very clear today because I'm not speaking now of being perfect or living a mistake-free life. I'm not talking about always dotting I's and always crossing T's. But what I'm referencing here in all transparency and honesty is that the passion, the excitement, the energy, the joy, the, the, the zeal, the the fire for the Lord is often unseen among so-called believers. In other words, the apathy in our worship, the indifference in our devotion, the meanness with which we treat people communicates a callous witness and terrible testimony about the Christ who died for us. And while I was studying, I'll be honest, really was, while I was studying and reflecting this week on this teaching for today, there were several moments when I had to check myself and attest to the disappointing ways and the inappropriate gestures and the silent responses concerning my own relationship with our Lord. I had to sit with some difficult realities this week and ask myself the question, here it is, I, I don't like this, but I'm going to say it anyway, uh, Donnell, how come? I get more excited about and mention more about and can talk freely more about to others about my favorite sports teams that pay me no money and yet 
Every time I reference them, I say we as if I'm a part owner or hold stock financially in the team. How come I'm seemingly able to have more excitement for and apparent appreciation for a Marvel movie or a famed television show or being a strong sneakerhead more than I am moved to mention the good news about Jesus? Now, 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 I, I'm not suggesting at all. I'm really not that these things are evil or inherently bad or wrong. My point is this, and I can't speak for you. I can just talk for myself that I've been guilty of the imbalance of affection with the scales of my Savior weighing in incredibly less than and not even equal to the other things in my life that seemingly outweigh the Savior's impact on my life. And someone please explain to me. I, I, I need some help. Doc Brown, you may be able to help me with this. Please explain to me. Why is it? Could it be? I, I feel my help. Why, why, why is it that when somebody is on fire for Jesus and excited about what the Lord has done, why is it that when someone does something elaborate and passionate and overly excited in worship, how come it is that when we look at that display of affection on our Lord, how come we always label them as crazy? Y'all ain't going to talk to me in this chat today. Or, or wrap too tight or question what in the world have they been through that would demand such a ridiculous expression of gratitude? Or how come we'll demonize them because we can't fundamentally understand why they're so animated and impassioned about Jesus compa compared and contrasted to us? Because our response about what the Lord has done in our life does not suggest that he's done anything at all. We won't tell them to calm down when their team wins the game. Ooh, I feel God. We, we won't tell them to silence their noise when they receive an amazing financial increase or, or deal on something. We don't mind when they run tell that about that stuff. But when they get excited about the Lord, and let me clarify something before your mind goes there. Let me clarify. I'm not suggesting, I'm not singularly suggesting that if you aren't outwardly manifesting some time of display, that it means that you don't love Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting that if you don't run around the sanctuary, lift your hands in worship, or shout loudly about the goodness of the Lord, then it means that you don't love him. That's not what I'm saying. But there is an air of interrogation that is often present among believers that questions, why is there such a vocal response about what Jesus has done? What in the world happened to them as to why they're shouting so loud. Y'all ain't catching this word today. Or loving on the Lord so hard. How come they won't stop talking about Jesus? What specifically did they do that God got them? Were they, the, were they in jail? Did they have multiple sexual partners? Were, 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 were they in some fight? What did they do? Because they don't have to do all that. Are they mentally together? Because their response, be it in worship or when sharing with friends, family, or familiar people in their lives, it should not take, this is what we said, that big of a response, especially since I've never responded to what the Lord has done in that way. And I'm sorry, y'all forgive me, I apologize, or maybe I shouldn't, but when some people speak of their salvation, when they talk about how the Lord has been a keeper when they mention their worthy moments of praise and how Jesus, I love this song, Donnell, when they talk about how Jesus is the best thing that's ever happened to them, there is an embarrassing culture surrounding so many Christian houses around the world whose foundations come from the pit of hell. And here is the culture. Say as much as you can about what the devil has done or is doing, but say very little about what Jesus has done or is doing. And this culture 
has permeated us so much that it silences our witness and our praise has been canceled. I've got a question for you today, though. Isn't what God has done in Christ well worth mentioning? Isn't what Jesus did for you well worth sharing? Does not what the Lord has done in your life carry enough weight to testify about, to tell someone about? Because church leaders say that about 95% of regular church members have never led one person to Jesus. 95% of people who are members of the church of the living God ain't never told one person about what God has done for you. And I want to caution you because please don't understand that your salvation does not, your salvation does not hinge on how many people you've led to Jesus. However, (laughs) the apathy or lack of telling somebody about Jesus is an indictment to the fact that maybe the Lord is really not worthy enough to mention for you. Contemporary Christianity teaches that you should confine your relationship with Jesus to the four walls of the church and keep it behind closed doors. Watch this as to not offend anybody. It's really no need to get happy about and overjoyed about Jesus anymore. If people get it, then they just get it. They can find Jesus on their own. There's no need to share the good news anymore. But that was not the mandate of our Lord. Those were not the instructions our Lord left before he went back to heaven upon declaring this movement of people called the church. The mandate is if you belong to the Lord, share the message of Jesus to anyone, to everyone, to anybody to everybody who stands in need. But contemporary Christianity, or maybe it's been this way for a long time now, says that you can love God but show no sign whatsoever about it. That you can be in relationship with the Lord, but you don't have to, watch this, share it. And it was that famed Indian prophet to the world, Mahatma Gandhi, who said, I like your Christ, but not your Christianity. He said, I would be a Christian if it were not for Christians. He said, I would be a Christian, but I've never seen one. In other words, what this man named Jesus did was too great for the response of his so-called followers to be that small. And I've been married Last week it made 18 years now. Let the church say amen. Yep, yep, yep. I got, I got the church board text. I'm going to get that, Doc Melly. I've been married for 18 years now. And after 18 years, you would admit that you know more in year 18 than you did in year one. Because after experience and time with my wife over 18 years, produces should have not a higher level of and deeper appreciation for her. If... If after almost 20 years of being in relationship with her, my level of love is the same and my response to who she is and what she is to me in stale and lackluster, then one could relationally conclude that something is off in the relationship. Because after years of cooked meals and bedside manner and intimate moments and communication difficulty and lukewarm days, but reconciliation nights, y'all ain't going to say nothing in the chat, and hospital scares and children who get on your nerves and makes you feel like the two of you are in a fight together in World War II against your kids, but you're doing it together with all of that love and response to the other person after 18 years should intensify. Well, after all the time you claim you've been with and involved in a relationship, after all the experience you've had with the Lord, it 
ought to evoke more enthusiasm and more passionate acknowledgement about our Savior. I mean, when you look back over your life and your time with the Lord and his wonderful grace that's been exponentially poured over your life and the attention to detail like the way that the Lord's sacrifice was offered up to you and the preparation and plans that the Son of God assisted in in creating a way of escape of trouble for you out of this life and the disciplined and devoted life that Jesus lived in order that you and I might enjoy the benefits of what we don't deserve and the humility and restraint that our Lord displays while on earth. That while looking at his behavior displayed when dealing with the foolish and fault-filled people would have been enough for me to go post it on somebody and lay hands on somebody. And yet our Lord had one thing in mind. He loved me so much that his love for me was stronger than a moment of self-gratification. And his love for you was so strong that he didn't want to put your eternal destiny in jeopardy. So with the power of the Spirit, the Lord, don't miss this, the Lord, please don't miss this, lived a sacrificial life so that when there were times when I was not a living sacrifice, his sacrificial life made me look like an acceptable sacrifice. And after realizing all of that, should not what Jesus did be worthy of mentioning? Should not what Jesus did be worthy of sharing? I could not get away from this story because Matthew says that whenever the gospel is preached, this story should be shared. I feel my help, I promise. Of all the stories recorded and shared in the Gospels, what is it about this story that prompted Jesus to say that every time the Gospel is shared, this woman's story should be told too? What did this woman do that was so connected to the Gospel that it must be shared? Well, let me give you the context so you can appreciate the content. Jesus is now about to be crucified, and the plan to kill him is, from the Jews' perspective, coming together quite nicely. They have put things in motion, and regardless of the earthly blessing Jesus has been to so many for the last few years, their desire to kill Jesus is so strong that it cancels their need for help. Y'all ain't hearing me today. Their desire to kill Jesus is so strong that it cancels out their need for help because, after all, they've been labeled, the Jews have, as God's promised people. And I wonder today, ah, this might get me fired, Pastor Griffin. Um, I wonder today that if those who call themselves Seventh-day Adventist Christians are also guilty of the same mistake of the Jews of Scripture. Meaning that because of this remnant theology and being told that Seventh-day Adventists are God's prophetic people, I wonder if that has made us cancel out and synonymously kill Jesus to the extent that who we are and who we have become is more important than who Jesus is. And as Jesus spends his final moments on earth, he's been seen spending time with his sacred circle, his disciples. He shares with his disciples about the Passover soon to be experienced, but notes of his impending death, which the celebrated Passover for years now has all been leading up to. It's during this time, as you remember, that Judas agrees with the chief priests to betray his Lord. And looking forward to the Passover, Jesus and his disciples find themselves in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper. And you remember Bethany, don't you? It was the hometown of Christ's good friends, Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Uh, Bethany was also the place where Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. 
Bethany is where preparations were made for Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's where the cursing of the fig tree happened. And it was also a significant place near where Jesus ascended back to heaven. And Matthew says that they are at the house. Please don't miss this. They are at the house before Jesus dies. They are at the house of Simon the leper, possibly to enjoy some fellowship time together before the Lord's death. What's interesting, though, is how Simon is identified in Scripture. Because he isn't just called Simon, but he's called Simon the leper, as if his condition meant more than his name. And all of us know somebody, all of us know a person who has been labeled to the extent that their identity is based on something bad. All of us know someone who is solely identified not by their name, but by their negativity. You don't know his name is John, but you know he has five kids with three different women. You don't know her name is Jessica, but you know she can't keep a job. You don't know his name is Jason, but you know he struggles with addiction. You don't know her name is Jasmine, but you know she always asking somebody for money. And what do you do when the negativity in your life seems to get more respect for your name? And yet, this is the type of house that the Lord, I feel my help. I'm going to get excited about the word all by myself. This is the house that Jesus chooses to be at prior to his death, the house of Simon the leper. Now, what's crazy, are y'all still with me online? What's crazy is the fact that lepers were not permitted to live in the city. And prior to them leaving the city to live in leper colonies. They had to shout, you know this before, you read the Bible before, they had to shout unclean to everybody they came in contact with. But one possible scenario is that <laughs> because of the Lord's love for people, he is more concerned with who you are than what you're struggling with. Y'all ain't gonna get happy on this. He, he is more concerned with who you are than what people have called you. And Jesus possibly breaks traditional norms and comes to the house anyway of somebody whose society don't want to be around. Or it's possible that Jesus is in this house because Simon has actually been healed of leprosy. And <laughs> I feel my help, Denise. He's, he's maybe hosting, he's maybe uh, having a farewell dinner for Jesus because he's just thankful that he's been healed. And every now and then, not all the time, but every now and then, you ought to host a thank party in your home and invite people over who are just grateful for what God has done in their lives. No agenda, no, no gossiping, no, no discussion about politics or sports. No, nothing's on the agenda. We have not come to talk about people, but you just want to host a thank party for the things that God has done in your life. Am I by myself? Anybody need to go home right now and start planning your guest list and start putting the food together and you want to invite people home because you want to say, hey, 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 can you come over because we just want to be thankful and at this house is a woman who's given no name in Matthew's account, but she comes in the house of Simon the leper prepared to give her thanks to Jesus. She comes in, the Bible says, with a bottle of very costly perfume. In Mark's gospel, he places a price tag on this bottle of perfume and values it at more than a year's salary. In other words, let me come get you. What you reported to the government that you honestly made in the previous year is the amount, y'all ain't talking to me, is the amount of money that this woman paid to worship her Lord. And the Bible says that's a lot of money. And the Bible says that's a whole lot of money. And the Bible says that she walks over to Jesus without saying one word, and as Jesus is reclining at the table, she just begins to break open this bottle, and without fanfare, without introduction, without saying what she, she breaks open the bottle, and she pours, <laughs> she, she, she pours a year, she's about to go homeless for the master. She, she, she pours, 
this bottle on Jesus. And to be honest, I'm not even fully sure she was on the guest list that night. I'm not sure if she was invited to the house that night. But when she sees Jesus, she makes a beeline directly over to her master and begins to pour this costly perfume over his head. She don't care if the oil gets on the food or his clothes. She don't care the mess that she's making. She doesn't care if they're talking about her. She's got one objective in mind. Pour this oil, pour this bottle of perfume on the head of Jesus as a thank offering for what he's done in my life. And I don't know about you, but how many times have you come to worship and you are so thankful? Who yes, help me God. You are so, the old folk used to say it like this, I'm so full. You are so filled up from what Jesus has done in your life. You don't care how you look. You don't care how much they talk about you. It's the fact that Jesus saved you. Because when she did this, the disciples who didn't do this looked at her and said, um, why is she doing this? Why, 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 why she, why she doing, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. She not even on the guest list. She just busted up in this house. Why is she doing this? She is wasting her money. She is wasting, watch this, her worship. In John's gospel, Judas is named to speak up and says, how come we ain't use this money for the poor? But the text says not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he used to take the money from the collection. But in Matthew's gospel, it says all of the disciples were upset because they looked at this act of the woman as wasting her money and that she should be a better steward of her money. Uh, Jesus, she about to be homeless. She going to be staying with us in a minute. Why are you going to let her do that? Why is she spending her year's salary on Jesus. And pay special attention. Pay close attention to the response of Jesus. Why are you bothering this woman? Why you, <laughs> why you worry so much about what she doing just because you're not doing it? Because what she did is a beautiful thing. What Jesus was saying in essence was, why do you want to take the attention off me? Why are you upset that this woman is paying me so much attention? What's bothering you about the fact that this woman is showing me so much love? And that's what I want to ask you today. How, you got to check yourself when you get that upset when someone is that elaborate on Jesus. You, you, you've got to check yourself when you get annoyed just because somebody is loud in worship. You, you got to check yourself just because somebody lifts their hand in the sanctuary. You got to check yourself whenever you look down on somebody who wants to bless Jesus and pour their oil over his hand. It is a sign that you must not think he's worthy of worship. What, what is it inside of you that causes you to look down on people who show me so much favor? And Jesus said, whenever the gospel is shared, what this woman did was so important that it should be connected to the sharing of the gospel. Why? Because what she did and what, and what should happen in response and as a reaction when people receive the gospel is what she did. Y'all didn't miss, y'all didn't catch it, so I'm going to come get you one more time. How this woman reacted at the party 
is how we should react when we receive the gospel. Y'all ain't catching, I'm gonna come get you one more time. This woman was so excited and so overwhelmed and so grateful about what Jesus did, she takes a year's salary and pours it on the head. Whenever, whenever the gospel is preached, when people really understand the gospel, their response should be like this woman. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Pastor, you, Pastor, Pastor, you just want to turn the Seventh-day Adventist church into a Pentecostal church. And what I'm telling you is, before there was a Pentecostal church, there was the gospel. How about this is how you're supposed to respond when you think about what the Lord has done in your life? So, so, so here it is. I'm going to give you four things, and, and then I promise I'm going to go. Because what I want to share is, how come we are so hesitant or scared to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's like, be honest, don't nobody really know you love Jesus? <laughs> and, and you can go to church and not love him. All right, here it is. Y'all tired of this. I know the food about to burn. So let me, let me Jay walk through this. Here it is. Why we don't like sharing the gospel? Here's the first one. And um, Doc Griffin, I own this one from clergy, from a clergy perspective as to why some of you all are scared to share the gospel. It's because, number one, some of us have never really been truly taught what the gospel is. Okay. Let me say it this way. We are ignorant of it. Here it is. This is going to be bad. Some clergy don't even know what the gospel is. And I'm not standing here. I promise I'm not stating that I've always known or was educated as to what the gospel is and have been always fully aware as to what the gospel of Jesus Christ means because truthfully, most clergy are ignorant of it and did not have it in their wheelhouse to teach. But I was intrigued, uh, Doc Griffin, you'll remember this, I was intrigued several years ago into the reality that it seemed to me at least that the gospel was not having a significant impact on my life. And I was not doing what this woman did. I wasn't excited every time I thought about my salvation. It, it seemed that the gospel was not having a practical and personal life not just in the life of myself, but other professed believers. And this curiosity led me to look into my own life to see just how it is transferable the gospel was in my own life. The joy of the Lord. Freedom in the spirit. Sharing God's love with others. I wanted to be more authentic in my faith and at the same time long for the freedom of the gospel the Apostle Paul talks about in Scripture. I was frustrated with, with I'm just telling all, you, all my business. I, I was frustrated with being or becoming what I'll term a mental Pharisee of sometimes judging people based on where they are or where they were with the Lord but never telling people who I was judging about God's love. And if we are careful, when there's an ignorance about the gospel and what the gospel truly is, when there's an ignorance about the gospel, you run the risk of becoming arrogant and judgmental because the opposite of the gospel is my work. Okay. The opposite of the gospel is my work. So when I look at people through the lens of what I incorrectly believe is the gospel, but in reality uh, is behavior masquerading as God's grace, I can no longer then be empathetic and compassionate towards other people. And what you win people with, you win them too. Meaning, if you were won to or brought into the church by suggesting that God's approval of you is based on your behavior, then you believe 
that your correct behavior is the gospel. God help me teach this thing through here. So you joined the church believing that the sum total of your Christian experience is how can I get my behavior to improve? The sum total of your experience is, how can I get myself to behave and act right? Here it is. How can I stop sinning so much and doing certain behaviors? Because if I stop doing these behaviors, then I'll be accepted by God. But that's not the gospel. Are y'all still here? Come on, just, just turn the oven off and leave the food in there. The gospel is good news. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The gospel is great news. All right, here it is. The gospel says, I, meaning Jesus, have saved you. That's the gospel. I, Jesus, have saved you. But we have sadly manipulated the gospel into bad news. But the gospel is not bad news, which is I have to save myself. Because the opposite of the gospel is the desire to save yourself and therefore cancels the cross. And what we've done, this is scary, in our attempt for people to behave better is essentially say to them that your work is better than his cross. And your work is better than his work. And his cross was not enough. And his work pales in comparison to the work we could do. But that's not the gospel. But the gospel is so potent with power that the gospel don't need your help. The the gospel is enough all by itself. Jesus is enough all by himself. You can't change anybody. All right, let me come closer. You can't change yourself. (laughs) But the gospel? (laughs) I said, but the gospel. I said, the gospel has so much power that the gospel heals and restores. It reconciles and reinstates. The gospel breaks addictions and it touches the poor. It releases the captives and it gives sight, the blind their sight back. The gospel sets free those who are bound and has so much power that can fix whatever's broken and break any yoke. That's the gospel. All right, let me give you a working definition. So you'll no longer be ignorant or unaware of what it is. Here's the gospel. The gospel is the totality, that's a big word, of what God has done in Christ for us without any human activity. (laughs) Oh my God. It's everything God has done in Christ for us without any human activity activity. That's the gospel. The gospel is what God did in Christ for us without us adding anything to what God in Christ did. Said another way, the gospel is the total work of Jesus. His birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his intercession, and his second coming. That, that, that's, that, that's the gospel. The gospel is the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin woman without the help of a man's seed. The gospel is the perfect life of the Messiah and how he loved on people. The gospel is that Jesus bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. It's that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, this in the Bible, y'all, was upon him and by his stripes we got healed. The gospel is that he died on Friday and that he rested on Sabbath. But early Sunday morning, he, he got up. That, 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 that's the, the gospel 
is that Jesus ascended back to heaven from the Mount of Olives and is inaugurated by the heavenly choir by singing this song. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty and vital. That's the, the gospel. It's explained in Paul's writings where he wrote that Jesus now lives to make intercession for us and one day soon the clouds will roll back like a scroll and Brother Hill will rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up and forever will be with the Lord. That's the gospel. And God forbid that we've been sharing the enemy's version of the gospel which is salvation is all on you and not on Jesus. But here's the second reason that we have not been reticent to share the gospel. Most of us have honestly never experienced the gospel ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I was made to believe that new information was the same thing as the gospel. So because you received new information, you thought you received the gospel. But learning about people's spin on the principles of an individual is not the same thing as learning about the individual person. There's only one way to truly know about somebody, and that's to sit with them yourselves and experience from their mouth who they are and spend time with them. And the reason why you can't share the gospel is because you've never experienced Jesus and this good news for yourself. And I know we're all in process and our relationship with the Lord ebbs and flows, but it's difficult for me to understand how people can be so callous and mean without cause and intentionally unforgiving and evil spirited without care and spread lies even when they find out the truth and be so insensitive to other human beings. It's hard to say that you've experienced the gospel and at the same time despise people with such venom because at the foundation of the gospel is love for people. Because when you, are y'all still here online with me? When you really experienced the gospel of Jesus Christ, whew, I felt that this week, Doc Griffin. When you become overwhelmed by his grace, Ooh, y'all ain't talking to me. And, and what the Lord did for you and continues to do for you, it makes you so filled and fueled with the Lord's love that you can't help for other people to feel and experience the gospel. You're so excited about the gospel's implications on your own life that you feel like that Old Testament prophet Jeremiah who said, if I should keep silent about it, it's going to be like fire in my bones. And this is what bothers me and honestly makes me nervous about today's contemporary Christians. It's the, y'all forgive me, it's the seemingly dead and dire experience when you reflect who Jesus is in your life. It's like when someone talks about what Jesus did, you don't, you don't feel nothing. It, don't do, it, it doesn't do anything for you. It, do, it, it doesn't, because every time the gospel is shared, we should talk about what this woman did. And the woman's response to what Jesus did was she looked crazy. For should not our lives be the walking billboards about the grace, mercy, and love of God? When you experience the gospel, I mean the real gospel, not an imposter's version, but the real authentic gospel, you, when you experience that, it ought to move you. It ought to bring you to tears. It should evoke some level of response. The gospel should overwhelm you with great joy, but surround you with great reverence and respect when considering the love that God has for you. When you really experience the gospel with the understanding that God was in Christ, 
reconciling the entire world to himself, it should leave you all struck with amazement about God's plan and promise to redeem you with his undeniable love and grace. And I long for the day, Doc Curry, when people who profess the name of Jesus would actually experience the gospel and they become so infectious with thanksgiving about the gospel of Jesus Christ that people desire to know more about this Jesus that you claim to know. Because Nobody wants to experience anything from someone whose experience with someone or something is not indicative of the overwhelming happiness you feel when you come in contact with said thing. That's, that's, that's what one of them grammarians call a run-on sentence. That's all right. I feel like running on uh, today. Uh, uh, simply stated, if you are not happy about Jesus, what makes you think somebody else would? And then we degrade and demean people. I don't understand. I don't understand how you can get through this life without Jesus. I don't understand why my son just won't give his heart to the Lord. I don't understand why my daughter just won't come back to church. It's because it doesn't seem like it's working for you. When you experience the gospel, like the woman at the well, you should have only one response, and here's your response. Drop whatever you're doing and go tell whoever you see, come meet a man who can change your life. Here's number three. The reason why you can't share the gospel is because this used to mess me up, Doc, Doc Esmer. We place too much stock into how other people are going to receive the gospel. We're hesitant to share because of our fear of how people will respond to who we're talking about. But I release you. I release you today under the word of God in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God for salvation. All right. God's acceptance of me with no strings attached. Ooh, God help me not to get too emotional. His, his love for me with no strings attached. See, 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 you excited because you got a whole lot of likes on Facebook and, and you excited because you got a whole lot of followers on Instagram, but people will like you based on speculation, but Jesus loves you even with all the evidence. His acceptance of me with no strings attached ought to be enough for you to tell somebody about him. You know what? And, 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 and they annoy you, but, but I ain't annoyed no more based, based on this. You know what? Um, and I'm not saying this to demean anybody, uh, Nico. I'm just making a point. Here it is. Jehovah Witness ain't afraid to tell it. I don't know what they knocking on my door. I'm busy doing laundry. I'm trying to get something to eat. And then these Jehovah Witnesses, they ain't afraid. You know who else ain't afraid? Maybe I'm telling on myself again. You know who else ain't afraid? Um, that lady in the uh, kiosk at the mall, she ain't afraid to share. And don't tell me you don't look away when walking by her so she'll get the memo not to ask you anything because she got a new product that she wants to give you about how to make your hands more soft. She ain't afraid to tell you, come get this. The man selling flowers in the middle of the street ain't afraid to share. But professed Christians, for some reason, we, we get amnesia when asked to talk about the person that brought you out. When asked to talk about the person who saved you. But do I have at least one person online that'll throw something in the chat? Do I have at least one believer who like Paul who can scream, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. And here's why. The gospel is God's greatest weapon against the enemy. All right. All right. All right. I'm almost done. Um, recently, at least a couple times for the, for the last month or so, um, um, 
I, I, I drive up 29, and I go to this um, building um, called Lifetime Fitness. And um, I be in the gym with our, with our, with our musician, Brother Donnell Josiah. I, I be in the gym and, and lifting weights. And, and last time I went, that's why I ain't come this week, last time I went, uh, we, we lifted so much weight, I couldn't even put my hand, I couldn't even lift my hands in the sanctuary. They, they thought, uh, Doc, Doc Brown, I just didn't love Jesus, but I couldn't get my hands up because I lifted so much weight. And, 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 and you can't, <laughs> let, let me tell you, y- y'all that lift weights, you know when you ain't really doing nothing, when you can laugh and joke in the middle of a set. If you laughing and smiling, why you ain't, you ain't lifting nothing. You ain't, cause, cause when you finish lifting, your face ought to show some sign. There ought to be a scowl on your face based on the weight. And as I was driving home, I said to myself to them, man, this weight is heavy, but if I keep lifting, I'm going to be strong and ain't nobody going to be able to stop me. Well, the power of God is the gospel and the gospel is so strong that no devil can defeat the gospel. No demon in hell can stop the gospel. When you receive the gospel. And this is why you shouldn't be scared about sharing the gospel. It's because (laughs) it's not your story. It's his story. Okay. All right. All right. Um, So here's the gospel. The gospel starts off in Genesis 315 with God's message that I know y'all messed up, but I got a plan, so don't worry about it. And so all through the Old Testament, God has been making promises to his people. So when Jesus shows up in the New Testament, Jesus comes saying, I am attached to what happened in Genesis 315 And I'm coming to let you know, let me see if you can catch this. I'm coming to let you know that I am a promise keeper. See, that that didn't do nothing for y'all online. That that didn't do nothing. the, The gospel is every promise I've given, I am making manifest in your life. And yet we feel that we gotta bring something to the table or add something to the mix. But the gospel is not the gospel if the gospel is added to something by us. In order, <laughs> in order for the gospel to be effective, we got to stay out of it. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Let me, yeah, I know y'all don't like this, but I'm preaching the Bible. Let, let me say it this way. When I got married 18 years ago, Denise, my, mother, my, my wife said, I want you to work your strengths. I said, what's my strength? Stay out the kitchen while I'm cooking. Y'all, okay, y'all ain't, ain't going to help me preach this thing right here. She said, that ain't your strength. Your strength is you can go to the grocery store and buy and purchase the food and then bring the bags in the house. But once you bring the bags in the house and take the food out the bags and put it on the table, you go out the kitchen, go watch a football game, go watch a basketball game, go do something else, but don't come back in the kitchen. Why? Because if you come in the kitchen, you'll mess up the cooking. So here's what I'll be doing around Thanksgiving. Don't judge me because y'all do the same thing. What I'll do is I'll bring the stuff in, but I'll leave. But once I start smelling the aroma, I feel like preaching. Once I start smelling the aroma, I'll step into the kitchen and start trying to nibble stuff when she ain't looking. But after 18 years, she hit the game. So she always got to look over her shoulder to make sure I don't come in the kitchen. Because if I come in the kitchen while she's cooking a good meal, I can mess up the meal. God says, once you bring yourself to me, stay out of it. Here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. Go ahead and start playing it, Donnell. Here's the last thing. Why are you scared to share the gospel? Because we believe we ain't good enough. The enemy has made us to believe. I need y'all to hear me on this. The enemy has made us to believe that we have in fact outsend his grace and that the blood of Jesus 
has actually lost its power in our lives. And it's a melancholy truth that many professed Christians feel that salvation is based on their merit or what they do. But let me release you. Let me release you. If you're not going to heaven because of everything you're done, you've done, then surely you're not going to be lost because of everything you've done. Most Christians feel that heaven is only reserved for those who have been good enough. And for those who have checked all the boxes. And for those who have done enough to make it in. And I'm, I remember growing up, Esmond, I don't know if you felt the same way. I remember growing up partially feeling so afraid. I'm being honest. And, and fear-filled that at any moment my name would come up in the judgment. And if I was sinning at the exact moment but that, that my name came up, I would miss out on eternity. So I lived this quasi-scared field. I always wanted to. I, I didn't, didn't want to want to catch, let them catch me with my work undone because, because if he did, I'd be lost. But that ain't the gospel. But it is the enemy's plan. It's to get you so scared. It's to get you so scared that it's not even worth your time attempting to explore a relationship with the Lord. He wants you so fear-filled because he says, he's told you, the chances of you getting into heaven are so slim that you'd have a greater chance to win the lottery than you would making it into heaven. Besides, the enemy says, you've already done so much You've already done so much wrong to disqualify you for paradise. What's the point? What's the point? You ain't good enough. But Doc Brown, I hear Paul preaching in my head saying, for it's by grace you've been saved. Through faith. And it's not of yourself, but, but it's a gift. It, it's, it's a gift. It ain't Christmas, but it's a gift of God. Not as a result of your works. You can't boast about what you've done because it's not from you. The gospel teaches us that salvation isn't contingent upon how good you are because salvation was never been about, salvation has never been about how good you are or how bad you are, but it's always been about a great God who's been so good to us. So we look at ourselves and then judge our goodness based on our behavior and then conclude we ain't good enough. While I'm here, let me set you free with something that set me free years ago. And here it is. And it may be a little confusing and possibly, Dr. Curry, difficult for many of us to receive about the gospel. And here it is. The gospel is actually not fair. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's not fair. The gospel is not fair. And, 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 and the gospel is not fair from our perspective because the gospel simply does not make natural sense. It is humanly confusing because the gospel allows for people who we would look down on and reject and throw away and cast aside. The gospel allows them to be accepted. All right. Here's your moment of praise. But the gospel is also unfair because it allows you to be accepted. Now, 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 
for the five of y'all that's been good all your life and never done anything wrong and came out the womb praising God and never gone left when you should have went right and always done what God has told you to do for the five of y'all watching God bless you but for the rest of us that's been around the block and messed up a time or two and has shamed the name of God thank God that the gospel ain't fair because the gospel accepts you too The gospel says, I know what you've done. <laughs> it's, it says, you're guilty. But the problem is that um, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. I know you're wrong. I know you're a hypocrite. I know you're sin-filled. But the problem is, if grace was an ocean, then all of us would be sinking. I know you're messed up. But the problem is that God's grace is sufficient. And his power is made perfect in my weakness. I remember, I remember a few years ago, the nail, I was going 89 in a 55. <laughs> okay. Um, I was doing 89 in a 55. That, that's what they call reckless driving. That's, that's what they, that you weren't just speeding. They call that reckless driving. And, um, and I got pulled over. And I'm not sure why, this ain't no disrespect to anyone in law enforcement, but I don't know why police officers always ask that infamous question, do you know how fast you were driving? They always ask that first. And what I want to say is, obviously I was driving a little too much over the speed limit for you to pull me over. I knew I was speeding. And he said, give me your license and registration. And how many of y'all been pulled over before and you know you ain't done nothing, but you're nervous that something may come up on your record and they may take you in? I was, I was sitting there biting my nail. I said, oh, Lord, I pray thee. Oh, God. And the man came back. And I know it's reckless. So it's by about $200 or something. He said, Mr. Washington, I know you were speeding. You know you were speeding. And I should really write you a ticket for $250. But for some reason, I'm not going to give you a ticket today. I'm going to let you go. The only thing I want you to do is be safe on your journey. Well, I came today to let somebody know that you're a reckless driver. You've been driving fast for way too long. But when God pulls you over and he looks at you and he says you're guilty, you done done it now. You should be on your way to hell. He looks at you with the eyes of faith and say, go and sin no more. Every time you preach the gospel, her story should be told. Why? Because after he lets you go, your response should be, God, I've come to pour my praise on you like oil with my alabaster box. Don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears. See, see, that's why you can't look down on people. That's why you can't look crazy at people that want to thank God for the salvation in their lives because he's done that much. Come on, Zena, where you at? Come on, Zena.
I think what what Jesus has done for all of us is worth sharing with somebody. How he saved you, what he saved you from, how he's interceding for you right now, and the fact that he's got a plan for all this stuff, for COVID, for monkeypox, for the death of your loved one, for the frustration of your job, one day it's gonna all be over. And you'll be able to look Jesus in the face and literally give Jesus a hug just to tell him thank you. But until that day, maybe there's somebody online right now who wants to say, you know what, I want to I wanna know more about this Jesus. I want to I want to find out about this man who before I was born made a decision to die for me. I want to know more about this man named Jesus whose love is so overwhelming for me that he risked being scarred with nails for the rest of his life so that you would be eternity with him for the rest of yours. And maybe there's somebody watching right now you want to say, I want to find out more about this Jesus. Just slip into the comments and say, I want to find out about Jesus. That's all you got to put. I want to find out about Jesus. You can call the church. We will answer and make sure we tell you about this man named Jesus. And then what we are supposed to do as a church is when you find out about Jesus, you're supposed to go run tell that. You're supposed to go tell somebody else. Because isn't what he's done worth sharing to somebody else? Father, in Jesus' name. Wow, you've been good to us. more than our hearts really know at this moment. More possibly even than we can express. But reignite a fire. Reignite passion. Reignite zeal for us to love on you more. And if we're embarrassed, if we're nervous about what so-called disciples will say like they said to the woman let our response be you weren't there when he found me and you don't know the cost of my oil and so God as we start a new week as children and teachers as school resumes and a newness of something begins Help us to begin it with you. Realizing and understanding that the gospel makes the difference in our lives and it's worth sharing to somebody else. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. said that we don't think we're good enough. It's one of the reasons. One of the reasons that we can't share is because we know what we like. And if God can do that for me, what more can he do for someone else? 
Lord have mercy. It's time to stop being secret agent Christians. Come out from under and let the people who you work with know who you are. You ever prayed with anybody in your job? What about your neighbors? Do they know who you are? Do you know that you've been saved? That you can give that same gift to them, the option of it. Lord have mercy. Mm, mm, mm. I tell you all the truth, I hate to even give these announcements right now because I don't want to kill the spirit here. Remember grab and go tomorrow, please. Men, Sabbath school at 1.30. Next week's Sabbath here is Women's Day. One special announcement about that, they're wearing white. Wearing white on Women's Day with any accent color. So they wanted to remind you of that. And then we also want to remind you that on the 17th of September, we're planning to come back into church full time. But the real joy is that on the 16th, Friday night, before we come back on the 17th, we're going to have communion here at the church Friday night. So we want you to put that in your planning so that you can be with us at that time. Praise be to God to you, Pastor Wash. Praise be to God. You've truly given us a path forward. Our God is an awesome God, and you don't know the cost of the oil in my vial. And I don't know yours, but I do know the one who's paid the price for us all. Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, as we close our service today, we, we come before you as an open book, Lord. We ask to be used of you, God. Remove these obstacles that keep us from sharing who you are, Lord, in every environment that we're in, in the grocery store, in the drugstore, on the street, on the corner, when we're helping someone, when we're giving out food here at the church, Lord, let the Spirit of God live within us in such a way that we can't help but tell who you are. We can't help but share you because of what you've done in our lives personally, God. And let us know that your promises are true. So when you said it's done, it's done. We must embody that so that we can share that with others. Let us be vessels that can be used to your name's honor and glory to hasten your soon return, Father. This is our desire, our prayer, and our request this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen and amen. God go with you.